Glad to see you all here. Okay. Um, it's a little different than coming into a seminar room. Everybody just arrives instantly. <laughs> so this um, is the second in our series of master classes um, sponsored by the South Asia Institute. Um, uh, we had a, a, a very a, a lovely and smoothly running talk by um, Partich um, sorry, by <laughs> um, Kabi Raj last week, and um, I was I was worried about the technical issues, but it went fine. So hopefully, will things will be as smooth this week? Um, we have um, Partha Chatterjee with us, speaking from Kolkata, um, which is the wonderful advantage of of Zoom, is that he hasn't been able to make it back from Colombia yet, and yet he's as much with us as any of the rest of you are. Um, so I'll, I'll um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we're going to do here. Um, I am going to just give a very brief introduction. Um, Parta will speak for about half an hour. Uh, I may say just a couple of things when he finishes and then open up for your questions. And we will have um, a question and answer session. Uh, last time we ran um, actually until, you know, used the full time and ran until noon. Um, and uh, we, we did not take a break. Um, Parto, I, I should have asked you about this. Do you think it's important to take a break in the middle um, no. at some point? Um, it, it, it doesn't matter to me. I, I mean, uh, whichever way. Okay. okay, well, okay, so, so, um, so I'm, I'm not going to build in a break and then of course people will do what they do. Um, so with that, let me just say a few words. Um, Professor Chatterjee is, uh, has a, it's my understanding that you have a joint appointment in MISAS, um, anthropology and um, politics. Uh, is that, that sound yeah, about yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and is a founding member of the Subaltern Studies Collective. Um, one thing I, I didn't fill some of you in um, who weren't here last week. What we're doing in this, let me just do a little aside. What we're doing in this series of lectures is a um, basically South Asia studies view from Colombia. And we are beginning with um, the um, rather strong uh, representation of um, subaltern studies at uh, Colombia. And um, part of being, being, of course, a, um, you know, sort of a key representative uh, in our midst. Um, he has published more than 20 books. I won't list them, um, but he, but some of them um, I'm sure are familiar or most of them are familiar um, to many of you, including the, the nation and its fragments. Um, the, he won a, um, a prize in 2009, the Fukuoka Asian Culture Prize, um, for his, uh, extraordinary contributions to Asian studies. And um, his, I believe, most recent book, although they come out so frequently that I may be um, behind the times, is um, I Am the People, Reflections on Popular Sovereignty Today. In case you just saw the electronic version, that's what it looks like. Um, and his talk today, will be based on this book, which in turn um, was a series of lectures presented um, the, in the Ruth Benedict lectures in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia. Um, so with that, um, please join me however you can in welcoming Parto um, to speak. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, and uh, this is indeed a uh, uh, somewhat uh, new venture. I haven't 
seen anything. I mean, I've been associated with the South Asian Institute uh, at Columbia uh, over 20 years now. Uh, but this really is a very interesting and I think, uh, I think particularly useful way of um, both you know, community building among South Asian scholars and students at, at Columbia. Uh, and also, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, um, becoming familiar uh, in a more sort of, uh, although it's still virtual, but even then, uh, a sort of face-to-face -face, uh, way in with uh, our colleagues uh, along with our students. So I, I find this particularly, um, I must congratulate uh, Kathy for organizing something like this. And I'm very happy to, to participate. Uh, I also s noticed that there are probably more faculty than students in the, uh, among the people attending uh, now, but that's all right, I, I, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, <coughs> No. Uh, so what I'll do is I, I think I'll just, uh, since um, at least the students in the class were asked to, um, to read the book, which is not a very long book, it's about 150 pages or so. Uh, <clears throat> what I'll do is uh, I'll just flag what I think are um, some of the sort of key uh, themes that I discuss in the book and which I'll be happy to talk about uh, after I've finished. And if you have questions, there may be several other uh, topics that are covered in the book, which I won't have time to mention now, but I'm of course open to uh, you know, answering questions on anything that's in the book or any related uh, topics um, that um, you might think about. So let me begin sort of uh, go sequentially through uh, the lectures as, um, as they appear in the book. Uh, I begin, there is a kind of chronology, uh, historical chronology in the way in which I um, discuss the several topics that are covered in the book. Um, but uh, I begin sort of immediately after World War II uh, and uh, specifically the Tokyo trial in 1946, which is when uh, Japan as the defeated power, uh, uh, several of the leading political and military figures in, uh, in the Japanese regime uh, were put on trial. Uh, the reason I, I um, begin there is in a sense, it, it sort of gave a, a, a sort of dramatic uh, instance of the sort of significant change that was about to take place in the entire global order. Uh, the change was still hadn't happened, but it was about to happen. And I particularly use the uh, dissenting judgment of uh, the Indian judge on this bench, uh, Radhabinod Pal, who is the only one uh, among the, what was it, 11 judges were they? Uh, or, or 13, I now forget. Uh, the only judge who completely dissented from the others and basically said his argument was that what was going on was victor's justice, that this was not a legal procedure, that what was happening was that the winning side in a war was imposing uh, their judgment on the losing side and it was nothing but retribution. Uh, in fact, he, he suggested that instead of a legal tribunal, what could have been arranged was a political uh, commission uh, of um, identifying and, and condemning 
uh, war crimes, uh, but political ones. Uh, and Paul said that would have been perfectly legitimate. Uh, it would have um, it would have highlighted and brought to the attention of the whole world uh, atrocities that the Japanese uh, he did not uh, he did not um, uh, deny that there were many atrocities that the Japanese had committed on the occupied countries uh, and the people of the occupied countries, but he said that the legal procedure was completely unjustified because what he was arguing and, and in the background was the fact, and this was going on immediately after Japan surrendered, the fact that the old imperial powers were reclaiming the colonies that they had lost to the Japanese. So the British were reoccupying Burma and Malaya. Uh, the Dutch were reoccupying Indonesia. Uh, the French were reoccupying Indochina. And what Paul suggested, well, this is Victor's justice because on the one hand, Japanese were being, um, were, you know, Japanese officials and leaders were being tried and condemned for uh, atrocities, which various uh, victorious powers on the Allied side could equally have been alleged to have committed, including, of course, he kept referring several times to the atomic bombs that had been dropped on, on uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. <clears throat> OK, so what Paul was arguing was for a global order in which every nation would have a right of self-determination, that is to say, to, uh, to create their own sovereign nation state. That's the first thing. And second, that each sovereign nation state must be equal in their sovereign status. Now, this is the new world order, the global order that Paul he clearly stated this in, in the judgment. And later on, there are other occasions when Paul elaborated on this. And of course, we know that this, although in 1946 or immediately uh, in the early 1950s, for instance, if you think of uh, occasions such as uh, um, the Suez affair um, in as late as 1956, when, uh, when Nasser, having come to power in Egypt, nationalized the Suez Canal, and that led to the British and the French uh, actually sending in, an army, uh, sending in armies to reclaim the Suez Canal. And of course, so, so in a sense, uh, there was still uh, resistance uh, to conceding that the old empire had to be given up. But in effect, as we know, by the 1960s, um, the late 1960s, certainly once most of the African countries were, uh, um, had um, their national, own national governments. We, we call this period the era of decolonization, that decolonization was on its way. And, and of course, by the 1970s, as we know, the present stru structure of the United Nations, uh, in 1946, there were some 50 countries which were members of the United Nations, only 50. Uh, 51 or something. Uh, uh, now, of course, as we know, it's nearly 200. Uh, and formally speaking, every country is equal in its sovereign status because as members of the United Nations uh, in the UN General Assembly, each member state has one vote. Of course, we know this is not how the real power is structured even within the United Nations, because there is a Security Council, and that, of course, <clears throat> has <clears throat> uh, five permanent members who have the veto. But let's not get into uh, that uh, topic right now. The reason why I begin there is, in a sense, to uh, emphasize the moral power that the nation state uh, had acquired and still had uh, in the middle of the 20th century. 
the moral power which of course earlier on in the west the moral power of the nation state had been well demonstrated earlier uh, let us say in the um, in the lead up to the first world war when for instance if you those of you remember uh, that history uh, for instance before the first world war <clears throat> uh all over europe certainly most of western europe uh, there was a very strong socialist movement the working working classes were well organized into trade unions into large social democratic parties and there was something called the international what was the second international and formally speaking all the socialist parties were basically had argued that the national uh, competition and rivalry between the different European powers were actually the rivalry of the ruling classes and that the workers have nothing to do with this and, and that the socialists should not join the war effort of their uh, nations. That's not what happened because in, 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 the, in the two, three years leading up to uh, the First World War, one country after another the trade unions and the socialist parties all joined in the war effort of their individual uh, nations. Uh, and of course, the nation was at this point, so World War I, World War II, was had the, the moral power, the governments of each of these nation states had the moral power to demand that their citizens sacrifice, they go to war, of course, there was um, effectively conscription. Uh, all uh, able-bodied, not only men, but also women, were assigned various roles in, in the war effort. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and the nation was, was capable of demanding this sacrifice uh, from their people. Uh, this was generalized and this is what i was suggesting um, in uh, by referring to the decolonization uh, period this was generalized throughout the world uh, once the national efforts and this wave of national uh, sometimes it was um, uh, national liberation through armed struggle in many other cases, probably in the majority of cases, there were negotiated transfers of power uh, from the uh, ruling European powers to a new nationalist uh, political elite in, in the various new countries that emerged in Asia and Africa. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so I begin from that moment of the moral power that the nation state could wield in the middle of the 20th century. Something happens in the second half of uh, the 20th century when the state or the nation state begins to lose this moral power. How did this happen? So the first episode, I, I discuss the welfare state in Europe, in Western Europe in particular. Uh, now the welfare state, of course, is in some ways, a, was seen as a fulfillment of the promise of citizenship, uh, national citizenship. That in fact, the welfare state was basically, it was argued that just as uh, the various democratic struggles in, in the European countries, uh, the people had won uh, political rights first, the right to vote, the suffrage, uh, basically by the 19, late 20s, early 1930s, all the Western European countries, there was universal suffrage, uh, including uh, the, uh, the, the right of women uh, to vote. Uh, that was hard won, but it was more or less one, except I think in Switzerland, where it was much later, I think in the 1950s, 
But otherwise, by the late 1920s, <clears throat> most of the European countries, women were vote, were allowed to vote. Uh, the entire working class uh, was, uh, was given the vote. So you had universal, universal political freedoms. Uh, these were then included, and this was the promise, that it would, citizenship would then involve social and economic rights. And these social and economic rights, the right to livelihood, uh, the right to uh, health care, the right to uh, education, the right to housing, uh, all of these were basic guarantees which the state would guarantee as universal rights to all citizens. This was the crucial uh, development of that, that took place uh, in most of Western Europe uh, by the early 1950s, what we broadly speaking call the <clears throat> welfare state. Now these were of course rights that were universally guaranteed to all citizens. It, you know, these were rights that came with um, citizenship itself as a, a, an entailment of citizenship. Uh, now, what, what I then discussed was that in terms of the administration of the welfare state then, there emerged from within the system itself a need to build in discriminatory entitlements. Uh, one of the major points of debate were, for instance, the, you think of a situation like the health service. Um, I think I, I give the example mainly of the British National Health Service, which uh, develops in the 1950s. And then by the 1960s, you have uh, essentially the entire university system, where again, it's basically uh, government guarantees salaries um, of university teachers and employees and so on. Uh, and the question arose, what would be the salary of, let us say, a, a surgeon as compared to a nurse? Uh, what would be the salary of a university professor as uh, compared to a school teacher? And should there be a difference? What would be a legitimate difference? And this is something that began to, it had to be built in to the system itself. Uh, what this means is that although on the one hand, you have a notion of equal citizenship, uh, which entails a set of universal rights, uh, which covers a whole range of, you know, almost uh, basic necessities of, of, of living, you know, from livelihoods to housing, to health, to education. All of this is, is as it were guaranteed to all citizens. And yet at the same time, while the right is equal, there is a differential uh, scale of benefits the benefits are not necessarily equal. And this had to be built in for all sorts of reasons. There are interesting arguments that are, so would, you know, how would individual merit be recognized? Uh, how would um, incentives be given to develop skills, to develop, to perform better and so on? So uh, how would, for instance, a longer period of education be rewarded? Uh, compared to someone who had not been, uh, who had not, uh, um, you know, spent long years in university, for instance. So, once this happens, you begin to get within the welfare state system a whole range of criticisms emerging. One, a major line of criticism is that the system is wasteful. It is wasteful and inefficient that, in fact, a very major line of criticism is that those who are able, who are differentially benefited, who have higher incomes, and who would be able to actually pay for services, were using 
the uh, state services, the welfare services, and using them far more proportionately than those who really need them, largely because they also happen to be better connected, they, they know the system much better, and therefore they are much better placed to use the public services for their, for their own benefit, rather than those who uh, are relatively uh, distanced from the systems of uh, higher education and, uh, and government bureaucracy. And they are the ones who actually get left out. And so increasingly, this opens up to what is now called the neoliberal uh, criticism of the welfare state. It, it begins late 60s onwards, people like Hayek and Milton Friedman and so on are very major figures here. Uh, and it builds um, in terms of its, its academic <clears throat> justification, it builds much more uh, strongly in the United States, uh, in the United States, particularly the universities, economics departments, business departments, and so on. Uh, and this neoliberal criticism, uh, we know, then turns the whole uh, uh, you know, system of governance in uh, Western Europe and North America uh, <clears throat> onto one which is now uh, following Foucault is called governmentality, which basically means that government benefits will be directed at targeted populations, that populations will be identified in terms of very specific needs. And it's only in terms of, the est of an estimated cost and benefit of particular uh, 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 target population groups that government benefits would be uh, extended. Uh, so the effect of this politically was that the large consolidations of populations around government benefits. So for instance, in relation to the health service or in relation to education or in relation to housing, because these were universal rights and administered universally for an entire population, demands, complaints could also be, uh, could also in, 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 in theory, uh, uh, involve a mobilization of, of ma large masses of people. This is what is completely broken up by the new form of, the, the new administration of governmentality. Because now projects, uh, schemes, uh, welfare, um, systems are defined in relation to very small target population. So you have a particular scheme, let us say, from for um, let us say for for women employed in uh, in schools. Okay, a separate scheme. You have a separate scheme for senior citizens. You have a separate scheme, so you have all. There, they could be benefits, the you know, uh, welfare benefits of different kinds, but they are no longer universally available for to all citizens. But very specific uh, schemes for particular target groups, defined as specific population groups. This has the effect, therefore, that demands are also scaled down to particular uh, small groups and mobilizations around demands cannot extend beyond you know, the old uh, entire trade unions, which involves you know, large masses of people. You know, in the European countries, it could involve you know, something like you know, 30, 40 percent of the people who are all members of trade unions. Now, those kinds of uh, mobilizations no longer become possible. Now that is the crucial impact uh, or the effect of, um, of the neoliberal critique uh, gaining uh, dominance. And this happens in the 1970s, 80s, 
The effect is, on the one hand, a very significant uh, rise in the role of experts in uh, policymaking, in deciding on government policy. Because, in fact, the whole point of uh, drawing up particular schemes to benefit specific groups or to satisfy particular demands is that there has to be a very detailed investigation uh, into to collect information on particular groups. How are groups organized? What, what are their real demands? How could those demands be satisfied? What would it cost to satisfy those demands? What would be an optimum way of balancing contending demands, right? That becomes the major exercise. And you have a whole range of what are called the policy sciences now. The whole range of policy sciences which develop precisely to address these problems. And they are very dependent on a huge technical apparatus of collecting information and then processing that information and finally offering uh, optimal, optimal solutions. Because it's dependent on experts now, what tended to happen politically was that they appeared on most major uh, issues in, in political, economic, social life. On most major issues, there appeared to be a broad consensus of opinion on what needs to be done. So on health, on education, on economic policy, trade policy, all of these sort of major aspects of government policy, there emerged very large zones of agreement, consensus, among experts on what ought to be done. The result being, and this was very uh, pervasive by the 1990s, that between major political parties, there was very little to choose because most parties were broadly speaking in agreement on major aspects of policy. They had to make minor uh, differences precisely to show their specific uh, position in relation to other parties. But broadly speaking, there was very little difference on major issues between the main political parties. The political result was widespread apathy among people in relation to politics. In country after country through the 1990s, the uh, turnout, voter turn turnouts, fell drastically. There were many major elections in European countries and in North America where hardly 40% of the people would, would show up and vote. Uh, this was the situation in the 1990s. Clearly something changed and something changed, I would say, it began to change from the early, the first decade of, uh, of the 21st century uh, the way I describe this, it's really the uh, financial crisis of 2008-9, which I think was a watershed. Because that clearly brought out in the first instance a major crisis in, uh, in a, a period of largely stable periods of growth and prosperity in the entire Western world. So broadly speaking, from the you know, post-war era, from the 1950s onwards until 2008-9, you would say there was a broad era all across Western Europe and North America of increasing prosperity, increasing levels of um, you know, income, standards of living, uh, all of this was widespread. 2008-9 showed up the extent of inequality that had grown within these societies. Uh, there were all sorts of other things involved. For instance, in Europe, there was the question of immigration. Immigration, which had, of course, the immigration had uh, occurred precisely in the period of 
of that rapid growth. Uh, and there was not enough uh, labor um, in available in these economies. Uh, there was a wholesale transformation of the working class into a middle class. Uh, so even though um, people were in working class occupations, their lifestyle had significantly altered. And there was very little to choose between middle class, the traditional middle class, and the lifestyle of younger generations from the working classes. So there was uh, access to education, access to university education, the move from people who were uh, born in working class backgrounds, moving into middle class occupations. All of this was, was, was characteristic of the period of growth and prosperity in the West from the 1960s all the way to the end of the, of the century. Uh, what significantly changed was precisely the crisis of, that was brought about by the, uh, in 2008-9. And that leads to a whole range of popular political mobilizations, popular mobilizations outside the structure of the traditional parties, outside the structure of the traditional trade unions. Uh, so just to think of the United States itself, you have on the one side, you have the conservative right-wing Tea Party movement, uh, again, outside the traditional party structure uh, by uh, leaders and uh, who are completely unknown outsiders. Uh, and then you have the Occupy movements, uh, particularly 2008-9 uh, was, was the, the, the uh, catalyst for it, uh, which was left-wing uh, precisely uh, focusing on the enormous inequality in, in wealth and income that had arisen in, in American society, the 99% versus the 1%. Uh, and yet it was entirely outside the known structures of political organization. They were not associated with the major political parties. They, they were largely leaderless. So that's the, the form that you, in Europe, you can think of a whole series of, of movements of this kind. This leads to what we is now being called populism. Now I won't go in detail into populism, uh, because that's that's well discussed in the book, and of course I will take questions on on my analysis. But the crucial point I wish to make in in this opening remark is that this is the background to what is being called populism in Western Europe and North America now. Uh, its immediate origins are quite recent, and its origins are in the crisis of the. Uh, of, of, of the entire social uh, structure itself. It, you know, it's not simply, it, there is an economic crisis, which was of course shown by uh, the, the financial crisis of 2008, uh, and a political crisis where the traditional political parties are all in a state of uh, disarray. Uh, this is true in almost every European country. Uh, it's true of the, think of the situation with the Republican Party today, where uh, the entire party is now under the complete command of Trump, who is a complete outsider. He, 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 he is an outsider to politics. How does this happen in the course of three or four years? Uh, um, in the Democratic Party, you have a complete rift between a large again, called, being called populist uh, mobilization, uh, for instance, Bernie Sanders being, being the, uh, the main representative of that movement, which is also seen to be left-wing, uh, and the rest of the party. And the rest of the party is seen to be the party, the section which could possibly be electorally viable, uh, the Sanders, uh, wing being considered not viable election, electorally. So that's the kind of situation you have. And of course, in, in Europe, you have, you have the rise of somebody like Macron, who, who basically uh, created a party 
and won in the space of weeks, literally weeks, uh, and all the major, you know, the major parties were defeated. So you have a situation like this. In the, the final point, uh, uh, I, I'm taking too much time. Uh, <clears throat> the final point is populism in India, which I've argued is a, has a much longer history. This is not the result of a very recent development. It's a much longer history, uh, which goes back to the 1970s. So there is, on the one side, you have the Indira Gandhi kind of populism, and then you have the populism of the regional parties, of which the most, uh, the longest uh, continuing uh, populism, in fact, competitive populism, is in Tamil Nadu. From again, from the 1970s, the the Dravid, the DMK, and uh, the split into ADMK, and ever since the 1970s to this day, it's one of the two parties that have held power in Tamil Nadu. So the question of whether populism depends on a leadership, whether leaderships can succeed one to the other, uh, all of these things have been uh, seen in the Indian case. In the Indian case, you actually have, as I just said, competitive populism, uh, a populist party is challenged by another populist party. Uh, and at the, at the regional levels, it's, Clear. I mean, one can uh, point to at least a dozen major populist parties and leaders, which uh, today and have over the over the, over the last several decades, uh, they have um, dominated uh, politics. The the question of the BJP, Modi, and so on is something also that I consider. In some respects, this can be regarded as essentially the same as a, uh, a, a, an example of Indian populism, a, a leader who tries to build a large uh, majority uh, by pointing to an enemy, which is, which is, is, is uh, seen to unify, which becomes the point by which the people get unified. But there is something more, this is what I'm suggesting that this is not just another variety of populism, because this is a populism which, in fact, has a, 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 a more long-standing agenda, which is actually changing the very definition, the very character of the republic itself. Uh, the, the composition, the constitution of, of the nation. Uh, there, is, there is a whole, of course, this is not a new uh, argument that's being offered. It's, it's been there from the very foundation of, of the Indian Republic. There, there has been a, a varying, a different version of what the Republic, the Indian nation and, and the Republic ought to be, uh, the definition of a Hindu Russia. Uh, and that is the uh, agenda that is being pushed. It is being pushed also, and now in more recent times, you can see this much more clearly, uh, with the active uh, support and, and consent of the major business, business interests. So it's a combination of this transforming hegemonic ideology, national ideology, which is different, along with an economic plan of transforming the economy to a far more uh, one that is fully dominated by corporate business. Uh, so that's the overall argument in the book. Uh, again, as I said, I'd be happy to take questions on any of these themes or the ones that I haven't uh, mentioned in this uh, introduction, but any, anything else, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Partha. Um, I would just like to maybe raise a couple of questions, partly coming out of um, the book itself, and maybe uh, accenting a couple of things. Um, so, one of the things that 
I think you're suggesting um, is that, and, and I think maybe you pointed to this in like your last sentence, um, that because populism has been around in India and, um, and presumably other, other um, nation states as well, that these are a kind of um, precursors for what we're seeing now in Europe and the United States. Would, would, is that something that you're suggesting that, that we're, we're, um, we're, can turn to India to see what, sort of in a more crystallized form perhaps, what we're, what we're seeing happening now? Um, and you know, the question is what are the lessons that, um, that we can see by looking at a place like India? Um, and, and, um, and then there's just one other thing that you say at the very end of the book. Um, yeah, you, you characterize your narrative as a gloomy narrative. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, that's sort of where we are today. But, uh, and then you suggest that, that, um, that the, the solution or a move to something that gets us out of this, this um, rather bleak prospect is um, the development of a new narrative that presumably comes, you suggest comes from intellectuals, that intellectuals play a role in developing this narrative and um, a, a narrative that will be emotionally appealing um, and um, will presumably mobilize people in, with a new political vision. And um, unfortunately, we don't seem to quite have that narrative yet. But um, the, the question about that point is, um, who are these, where are these intellectuals going to come from? Is it people like us in the academy, the kind of elites? Or is there some notion of uh, they're arising organically from, to use a kind of Gramscian term, um, from other sectors. So those are my, my two um, issues that I think would be interesting to hear you from. Okay. Uh, so um, both of them are, you know, if there are, if there are tough questions uh, that, that are suggested by my argument, both of those are tough questions. Uh, but but let, me, let me try and uh, answer them. You see the the idea that that let's say you know what what we see in countries like India or what 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 we have seen in countries like India over the last several decades were in a sense precursors of what we are seeing in the West. It's a very interesting narrative inversion because because of course you know uh, the whole uh, understanding always was that countries like India democracy is, 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 is a backward democracy. It's, it's a retarded democracy. And, and of course, in the West, it's, it's the advanced developed democracy. So how is a retarded democracy a precursor to, uh, to a developed advanced democracy? Uh, and the reason why this juxtaposition seems uh, credible now and I've, I've, I've uh, suggested various uh, terms that, that are now widely used to describe what's going on in the United States or in Britain or in many European countries. Uh, so terms like this is tribalism uh, or uh, of course populism as something that should never have happened in, in a, a properly developed liberal democracy and yet that's what we're seeing now. The, the idea, for instance, right now, when, when there's a suggestion that, that if Trump loses the election, he might not uh, leave office. Uh, it's been, somebody said, this sounds like Belarus. So uh, now, why, why is this happening? These were all characteristics which uh, supposedly happened precisely in, in those other backward parts of the world where people don't have uh, proper uh, democratic training and experience. Uh, 
And what I, what the reason why it's happening, and this was my argument, is that there is a, it's, it's precisely in moments of a deep crisis of liberal democracy, advanced ones, but a crisis, a, democ a liberal democracy in crisis, that these kinds of features, which perhaps were inherent, but concealed over all of these decades, maybe centuries, they suddenly appear on the surface. And this is the, you know, the argument about populism and the reliance on a leader to produce a, you know, what, what, what the analysis of populism suggests, an attempt to create bonds of equivalence among groups of people who are otherwise very heterogeneous and diverse. They have very, very different uh, demands and characteristics. And yet there is a leader who is able to bring all of them together and make the argument to, once again, create a narrative that we are all in the same position because we are all being exploited and dominated and oppressed by this one enemy, okay? And that is what rhetorically the leader is able to do. Why do people accept this? How are they persuaded by this? They are persuaded by this, by the belief, in the belief that this leader is a leader because it is they who have chosen and anointed this leader. So this is not a leader who is a leader because of hereditary dynastic kinds of claims. It's not a leader because that person is, has, has great experience in politics or anything of the kind. In fact, one of the most interesting aspects of populist leadership is that the leader is in fact trusted precisely because the leader is not very different from ordinary people. There is, there is a sense in which ordinary people recognize themselves in the leader, right? And, and so the leader does not necessarily have to have extraordinarily uh, unusual uh, qualities. The leader is a, is, is a much more credible populist leader if the leader has, let's say, come out from very ordinary circumstances, uh, is not a part of an, a, a, an elite formation, does not have an elite background, right? All of these things, in fact, uh, all of these sort of cultural, intellectual attributes or the lack of those attributes for which the elite would, uh, would condescend, would look at condescendingly on, on a leader like this would become precisely the marks for ordinary people to say, to, to identify with the leader. So that's the, the, this, the sense in which, but this is not supposed to happen in a developed liberal democracy. It's happening because there is such a deep crisis that, all, that traditional parties traditional forms of political organization, traditional kinds of conventions, uh, the, uh, the neutrality of a bureaucracy, the neutrality of a judiciary, none of these things hold anymore. And this is why the breakdown of, of liberal institutions make these advanced capitalist liberal uh, democracies look like third world countries. And that's of course seen, it is, it is alarming in many ways. Uh, and yet the, the resemblance is there. And so that's that in a sense, uh, the, the, the reason why a, a rhetorical use of something like this being a precursor. I don't know that I actually use the word precursor, but, um, but uh, it's a, it's a very uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable narrative inversion i think that's 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 uh, legitimate in this case uh, on the question of the intellectuals now uh, 
You see, this is the this is the question that that uh, affects. You know, it's 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 um, it's a question that relates not just to this moment, but I think any historical moment that can be seen as one of deep crisis and therefore, in a sense, marking some a, a, a sort of watershed uh, of a, a transition from one kind of society to another. Uh, it's not necessarily revolutionary or anything necessarily like that, but nevertheless, a crisis of that kind usually is overcome through a certain a, a, an investment, a, 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 an intellectual investment in the imagining of a new society or state or community of the future. So there is an, an, an imagination of what the future, a desired future would be like. Now, why is this something uh, that comes from intellectuals? And intellectuals can be of different kinds. You, 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 uh, Kathy, you mentioned Gramsci, and of course Gramsci speaks of both traditional and, and organic intellectuals. So traditional meaning, you know, for instance, today traditional intellectuals would be precisely, you know, university professors and, uh, and writers, established writers, and you know, uh, political commentators in in professionally uh, in in professional institutional spheres, they are traditional intellectuals, and it's arguable that traditional intellectuals generally are invested in the existing establishments. That largely traditional intellectuals those who are produced through the universities and through the established institutions of uh, culture. They are usually the agents of reproducing those institutions. They are the ones who reproduce those institutions. Uh, and so in the Gramscian sense, they are not usually, they would usually not be the ones who would uh, produce a narrative of a new future, right? Uh, they would come, perhaps, they would come, in fact, as in Ramshi's sense, precisely those social forces who are likely to be able to act in this crisis in order to move that society in a different direction. And they have to be social forces of different kinds. Now, at this moment, it's hard to see which are the different social forces, which, uh, which could be agents of change, right? Uh, because as I, as I suggested, certainly in, the, in, 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 uh, in relation to most of Western Europe and North America, it seems to me that in terms of, of at least the sort of identifiable social groups, right? It seems to me that it's only, uh, major corporate finance, the financial houses and their uh, owners who are politically and intellectually fully organized and conscious of their uh, position, of their role and what and how they would go about uh, protecting and preserving and perhaps expanding their domination. Um, I, I suggested that the way the financial crisis was handled in 2008-9 shows this very, very clearly. I, it seems to me it's, it's shown even now uh, in the way in which a phenomenon like Donald Trump is being managed. Uh, because this is in many ways a, a hugely risky enterprise to plump all your uh, stakes uh, in somebody like Trump. Uh, there is sufficient self-confidence, it seems to me, uh, in, in, in that organized class uh, that they can do this, at least for the time being, to go along with Trump if that would 
help them uh, preserve their interests. Um, all other groups, it seems to me, social groups, are politically scattered, demobilized. There is, there is no immediately, I don't see any existing uh, uh, political or intellectual um, cohesive force that would bind the, those who you might think of as moving society in a different direction. Uh, I don't see this. Uh, in the Indian case, that's the interesting uh, fault line, and I, I speak of this, uh, between what you might call the formalized economy and what is broadly speaking called the informal, which of course is hugely heterogeneous. There are so many different things, but that fault line is becoming stronger and stronger. So. Once again, I mean, the, the handling of the uh, epidemic uh, in the last few months has shown this very, very clearly. The fact that uh, that's, that such a huge national lockdown was put in place in a matter of hours uh, with clearly foreseeable uh, disaster to the economic lives of, of large numbers of people, yet it was simply not calculated. And then you had this incredible uh, scenes of you know, thousands and thousands of people walking hundreds of uh, miles back home because um, they were migrant workers. This is the so-called informal sector. Uh, <clears throat> and now, precisely in this period when normal politics has been suspended because of the sort of uh, emergency-like situation uh, of the epidemic, you have one legal move after another, one law after another being passed, which is essentially consolidating the formal economy, just fully consolidating it in a way that it's never been consolidated. Even this government, which had promised it, had not been able to do this so many years. Uh, so in the Indian case, it seems to me that it is precisely the, the, the uh, task of thinking of uh, and constructing a narrative that would define a livable future, a future, if not of prosperity, but, but certainly of, of, of a certain degree of uh, decent livelihood for this vast mass of the, the vast majority of the population, which is outside the formal sectors, the formal institutions, the formal uh, boundaries of uh, middle class and even organized working class. So, you know, think of workers in the formal sector in the public sector, for instance, in a completely different position today from the ones which are in the, in the informal. Uh, and that is, is the domain that has to be thought about. Now, will there be intellectuals to do this? What, what I'm calling intellectuals, they could, they could certainly be people who, for instance, they in, they, there's a whole range of people who are known as, as workers in, in so-called voluntary sector, non-government agencies, a whole range of, uh, they're not necessarily political parties, Right, uh, and yet there may be groups and uh, initiatives which may even be allied with, particularly with many of the regional parties which have very loose uh, political formations. So it could well come from those kinds of people. It could well come from school teachers and and uh, uh, people who 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 basically are the ones who uh, organize and protect their neighbors in the various localities, uh, villages, small towns, and so on. That's the kind of place where, where some, some of this will have to appear, it seems to me. But as far as I'm, I, I, you know, my view, the, the fault line is much clearer here. 
uh, between those who are who have a, a very deep stake in the existing machineries and institutions of the state uh, and those who fall very much outside it. Kathy, you're, 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 uh, you're muted. Okay, what I said was thank you very much. <laughs> for your um, wonderful talk and, and thoughtful answers. Um, we now have questions from the audience. Um, Bill, are you gonna handle um, calling on people or? Where'd Bill go? Okay, well, I might be able to handle it, except all I see is three raised hands and figuring out who they are. Um, okay. So uh, I guess I'll start from what is my top and ask um, Shauna Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Professor Chatterjee. And um, you know, I enjoyed reading the book and it was great to see the lectures and the book itself. Uh, I have to slightly, you know, um, I particularly like chapter two of the book because I think it's the sort of, you know, sort of crucial link between uh, the first, you know, uh, in the book, uh, between the sort of various historical processes that are taking place. And there's a, you know, there's, uh, you start with the problem of, you know, how the locus of sovereignty shifts from the absolute sovereign to the people. And this uh, transition sort of keeps repeating in the book, in the chapter at least constantly. So you have, you know, with Foucault, the question of the, you know, of the shift in power from a juridical political domain to the power of, you know, society, uh, the question of the shift from the nation state to the people nation. Um, and, you know, in Gramsci, the question of um, how the state, and it's how the state into the society operates in the West versus what's happening in Russia. And this sort of transition is constantly negotiated sometimes through civility, sometimes through conquest, sometimes through passive revolution. And for me, you know, the way in which you were building the argument sort of, you know, was trying to capture how power moves from the side of normal politics or what political science has seen constantly as the site of normal politics to this, you know, domain of so-called extraordinary politics, which is happening on the streets, which is happening elsewhere, you know, in the so-called space that is society. Um, and I was, you know, I, I just wanted to sort of pursue a question along those lines as to this false distinction that lies when we think, you know, at the heart of thinking about the political uh, between the sort of, you know, supposedly institute, institutional normal domain of politics and the rest. And whether um, this false dichotomy is the reason why populism is considered to be a form that is separate from democratic politics, um, you know, when it, when it actually moves constantly in tandem with processes of democratization. So thinking about democracy constantly means thinking about populism um, and, uh, you know, vice versa. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, that long question. So uh, should I take the questions one by one, or do you want to pile up a few questions? Whichever you prefer. Okay, let me, let me answer them, because this is a specific question. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, so <clears throat> you're quite right in, in posing the question this way, because in a sense, uh, what you might call the crisis of liberal democracy it really lies here. Because in terms of what you would call the normal politics of liberal democracy, the basic assumption is that masses of people don't get involved in politics as a matter of course, right? If you have every sort of masses of politics who are involved in, a kind, in the everyday business of political decision making, then things are completely, uh, you know, they, they, they simply go out of control, they become chaotic, right? So this is the whole, you know, the, you, if you remember, I mean, this becomes, this was the old debate, uh, of course, going back all the way to the Greeks, they have, they have debates over this. Uh, 
if you think of the period, uh, uh, let's say just before and during the French Revolution, you have exactly the same debate. So Rousseau on direct democracy. Is direct democracy possible, right? Uh, and the usual answer is, well, in a small sort of uh, town like uh, Geneva or something, it might be possible, but or, or the, or, or, you know, ancient Athens. Uh, but in a large nation where millions of people, how can you have anything like direct democracy? So the answer was that you must have an orderly system of choosing representatives, and it's the business of the representatives who will be specialized in uh, dealing with the actual business of making laws and deciding on policies and uh, implementing policies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the difficulty arises, and, and you might think that this is a very long history, uh, even in recent times. You have, so if you think of, of, of theorists like that Hannah Arendt, for instance, is a good example. Because for her, if you if you remember, you know, Hannah Arendt is was deeply concerned that the business of politics was being corrupted because it was constantly being tied with the social question. So questions like uh, social justice. Social justice cannot be a fit subject for of politics, according to her, because the question of social justice is posed at the level uh, by uh, masses of people who, if their, their views, if their opinions were to be constantly, uh, had to be constantly sifted through and accounted for, and then policies or, or, or decisions made in order to suit though their uh, views, then politics would become impossible. Politics had to be among people who had a shared view of what they are talking about. In a sense, if you think of it this way, discursively, they must share the same ground. Otherwise, politics is, is, is not possible. They cannot, they'll keep talking past each other. And of course, they will never arrive at uh, decisions that would be acceptable to everybody. The very principle of majority decision making in a, in a liberal democracy is that majorities are fluid. Some people, I could be in a majority today, I'll be in a minority tomorrow. On another decision, it'll, you know, I'll, I'll be, it'll be my, it'll go my way. Sometimes it won't go my way. And that is what normal liberal democracy is supposed to be. If you have a democracy which is divided into two warring camps, right? Then liberal democracy of that kind simply is not possible. Now, the difficulty with, with uh, what you're calling the politics that spills over into the streets and so on is when this arrangement of normal politics fails to satisfy large groups of people. So if, 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 for instance, if I were to go back to what I was saying earlier, uh, the sort of situation that prevailed in the 1980s, 90s, with the neoliberal uh, view of government coming into dominance, well, that would have been a perfectly, uh, that would have been a perfect example of the success of uh, normal, uh, liberal democracy. Because what you would have there is people would vote, a lot of people simply wouldn't vote, but that didn't matter. So those who felt uh, sufficiently strongly about politics would go and vote. They would, it didn't matter which party was elected, right? Bro broadly speaking, there was a general consensus that these are the policies, broad policies, or the broad framework of policies that have to be made which no matter which party uh, put them into operation, those decisions would be acceptable to large majorities of the people, possibly the entire population. They would accept it. And that is the success of 
normal liberal democracy. When that does not hold as happens from you know, the last 15, 20 years, that is when you, 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 you get people whose demands have to be made on the streets because their representatives are no longer seen capable of even listening to and certainly not acting upon their real demands. And that is when you begin to get, you know, that leads at some point into what is, what is populist politics. And that populist politics is premised on somebody, some leader, some movement, some party, uh, rhetorically being able to produce the slogans and produce the stories that tie together all of these very different but all equally agitated people uh, to be brought together within a single block and say, well, look, we are all in the same position and it's that uh, elite, that group, that entrenched power out there, that's the enemy and we must fight it. That is when you get populism. So uh, yes, you're right that, that it's, it's actually a crisis of normal politics that produces this other kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the popular uh, agitational mode to explode and, uh, and become really widespread. Okay, so we have um, a lineup of two. I have Samyak and Avnish. So why don't we begin with Samyak? Okay, uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, great. So um, thank you, Professor Ewing, for, the, uh, for organizing the masterclass. Um, let me first say that uh, I'm extremely fond of the book, uh, particularly because of the prose. It's a very infectious prose. And uh, there's a reason why I put it this way, because, um, you know, there's a, there, there is a, there is a particular section in the book which really got me hooked. And it, it, it was towards the end literally the last sentence of uh, the lectures when you say even after 100 years the people have not arrived and uh, this is absolutely crucial i felt this is very very crucial for what you were trying to get at because um you know i and i remember during the lectures there was a lot of um people felt that well this was very gloomy statement to make and um but what I feel, and this is where I would like to begin my question, is the people, uh, you know, we, we are very eager to see the people kind of uh, arise, right? So be it any kind of movement, and if we look at the, you know, Occupy Wall Street, or even uh, the BLM recently, or the CAA movement in India, or the Yellow Vest, as you point out, one crucial aspect of all these movements on the street is they are leaderless movement. And somehow, you know, it, it is like this situation where it's, it's like the people flare up and you are hopeful and then it petters out, right? So there is this rhythm that goes on and it's somehow I feel this is the rhythm of history, the moment in which we are right now. But, um, I was, and this led me to think about the, um, the very interesting equation that you set up in, 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 in the book. It's almost like a triangle um, of populism, one, one can call it. You have the leader, you have the people, and you have the enemy. And I was particularly interested in the enemy because um, there, is, there is a discussion about the people in the book, and you do talk about a drawing on Laclau, how both the people and the enemy are floating signifiers. Um, what I was uh, really interested to know is, you know, the, the, the way in which, and here I'm particularly thinking about the Indian case, because we, we, we have kind of entered a phase where there is um, some kind of, it's, 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 it's kind of, there is an enemy out there, that sense is there, but then the enemy is getting redefined every other day, right? So 
what it's it's it could be the muslim it could be pakistan it could be and if you talk about bengal um you know most recently just a few days back when the bjp in bengal organized this mother language uh, mother tongue day um on 20th of september it was bangladesh it was uh, the 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 muslim bengalis of bangladesh it was urdu urdu speaking people so the enemy is not something that is constant it 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 could be a college professor it could be a student right uh, delivering a speech it is getting redefined every day but what is also interesting here is the question of justice and this kind of um, ties me to where you began and i i was thinking because the the leader projects themselves as delivering justice right and the populist leader for that matter is someone who will say that i'm the arbitrator of justice i'm the deliverer of justice and here this is how i'm delivering justice be it through witch hunt be it through it could be through a range of things and these are not um these are not very stable so the question then that i have is where does justice lie in this uh, equation right is it in the figure of the leader that who says claims that well i am here to deliver justice to you my people is it in the body in 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 the people do justice lie there and the people will claim that for themselves which will be a very optimistic narrative uh, so to speak or is justice about really going after the enemy um like a, a bloodthirsty populist state okay uh actually there are two questions there one is about the floating signifier where the enemy can be redefined um, uh now that's that's very true but you see one of the things that's important is that we as you say that you can see the enemy being redefined and yet it's it's the the, the subject of this is is constant you see this as as constant it's the same group or the same people but the enemy is is shifting this is of course the effect of a successful rhetorical deployment of a populist strategy now it's not necessarily always successful because it is you know one of the things that's happened with populist movements many places is is the populist movements fade they don't they don't hold anymore you think for instance of something like telugu desam under nt ramara right and where it is today now today it is a kind of organized political party like any other political party but it does not have that populist appeal at all right so at some point it could be the succession that nt ramara died and then whoever you know uh, the successor was unable to to deploy this rhetoric right successfully so that the floating signifier could be refilled with with new content you see this was this this did not happen whereas at other points and and clearly it it did and one of the things that happens and this is interesting i i think i discussed this in relation to indira gandhi for instance where uh, the shifting actually took place by through the deployment of or or the identification of the enemy the people's enemy as indira gandhi's enemy right now if this is because indira gandhi's enemies changed over time they did not remain the same and yet it was possible to make people believe that these new enemies of indira gandhi are our enemies right now that would that would have to be deployed properly so so this is what you know the it, so the idea is who are the nations enemies who are the people's enemies who are the leaders enemies okay 
these would all depend upon the degree of identification between a leader and a people, right? A leader and a nation. You see, all of this is possible. But again, I keep repeating that this depends, you know, this is, none of this is given. All of these are the result of actual political operations. There has to be political action, right? Through the deployment of a whole range of rhetorical uh, apparatuses, you know, including media, including images, including narrative stories, uh, including uh, spreading of false news. I mean, all of that is part of, uh, and you can think of the technologies through which these things are, are, are operated. How, how is the narrative uh, circulated? How is it turned into uh, stories that people will believe in, right? That is, all of that is part of the politics of, of, of populism. Now, the second question about justice. Uh, when is justice delivered? Now, some of it could be actual benefits, perceived benefits to particular groups. So in a sense, this is a very standard practice of all populist leaders and, and regimes, which is to distribute benefits, gifts, essentially, of different kinds uh, to their constituents, to their uh, supporters, right? Uh, so, you know, Tamil Nadu is an excellent example where competitive this was done. So one party says, we will give you television sets. So every, every voter is given a television set. Now it's, it went into refrigerators, uh, laptops, all, all things like that. Now this is, this is just plain distributing benefits. It could also be done through actual government policies. So for instance, things like subsidized food, uh, and it's now expanded into a whole range of uh, different kinds of schemes. Once again, targeted. Very often, you know, for young women, for older people, for particular uh, locations, for particular ethnic groups. It can be. It can be a whole range of things like that. So there's there's that side, which is so. This is this is justice. Nobody else had given this to us. This leader, this regime is doing it for us. So that's one. The other is actually scoring victories over the enemy. So whichever is the enemy, an identified enemy, you say, well, this leader actually punished the enemy. This is a leader who actually acted against the enemy. So you can think of, you know, for instance, I think in some ways Modi operates on this very uh, successfully. So uh, what, what was still referred to as the surgical strike against Pakistan. So that is an enemy, a strike against the enemy. Demonetization was supposed to be a strike against the wealthy and these oppressive wealthy people. So, so these are also attempts to deliver justice. And what's interesting about the delivering of justice is the way in which it actually justifies the breaking of administrative, bureaucratic, legal regulations and, and conventions. Because the whole understanding is that justice is never delivered to the people because the legal bureaucratic apparatus is biased. It's, it's, it's tilted towards the wealthy and, and the powerful, right? They are the ones who know how to operate those, those levers. And of course, you know, even, a, 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 even if, for instance, our representatives, we elect them, right? But they're never able to deliver these to us because the legal bureaucratic apparatus is such that even good people whom we elect, if they stay within the bounds of law, and bureaucratic convention, they'll never be able to deliver the justice. So we need somebody who can actually cut through the legal apparatus and deliver things to us. You see, this, this has a very interesting 
uh, side to this about the qualities of a populist leader of this kind, very often people will believe that if you have sort of good, honest, uh, conventional people, they, they will never be effective in terms of delivering justice. We need people who can be actually crooked, who know uh, the ins and outs of the system and who can work the system. So very often you will get, you know, people who would say, yes, of course we know this person is, is corrupt. But he's, he, because he's corrupt, he actually is able to, because we know he, we, can, we trust him, he will work on our behalf and he will break the system in order to deliver justice for us. So in a sense, uh, this, this works completely contrary to the basic principle of, of, of liberal constitutionalism which is that that it's you know it's the procedure which must be fair the the final outcome may or may not be that's not the crucial thing but the crucial thing is the procedure should be fair whereas here uh, for the populist leader the expectation is that irrespective of the of the procedure the procedure to help with the procedure what we are interested in is the outcome is it getting something for us or not so that's the uh, you know, to your two questions, yes. Okay, um, Avnish? Um, yeah, hi, uh, Professor uh, Chatterjee, thank you so much. And um, I think Samyak actually touched on quite a few of the points that I actually wanted to bring up, uh, especially the notion that we are sort of living in this interesting time when we don't have uh, leaders for these young people uh, who are creating these movements. So my question is sort of a little bit about um, kind of as, as an anthropologist yourself, trying to kind of look at time from sort of a grander scale. I tend to read into Vedic and Puranic literature. So I'm looking at uh, yugas in particular, and I'm of the personal opinion, I, I hope others would agree that hopefully we are entering into Satyug uh, soon, hopefully before that clock hits zero, that's in Union Square. Um, but uh, I'm trying, huh? You're optimistic. So. I'm rather optimistic, yes. I'm, I'm quite an optimist. So I, I guess my question is sort of looking at sort of uh, from like a religious perspective and even, even an anthropological perspective, we've had these pivotal moments in history, whether it was the coming of Ram, Krishna, Jesus, Muhammad, and these people emerged as leaders and kind of represented a, a time and, and space and, and a people. So is the future going to be about somehow some leaders emerging or young people emerging as representatives of this era and and kind of going back to professor ewing's um remarks do we need a new intellectual paradigm because one thing i felt being at columbia for the last uh four years almost is that sometimes the discussions that we have in the intellectual sphere is inaccessible to people outside of the intellectual community so do we need to kind of change the way that we communicate as young people and, and what is sort of the future that you see in the next, hopefully, seven to 10 years before we end the world? Well, as far as the, the first aspect is concerned, you know, the emergence of prophets or avatars and so on, I have nothing to say. Because <laughs> okay. Uh, no it's not something I, I think about very much. Uh, okay. No, but 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 your second question, um, which is going back to what Kathy had asked, uh, intellectuals and what role uh, could intellectuals play? You see, once again, if you think of of intellectuals as particularly the way we understand intellectuals, people. Uh, who work in universities and, and write books and, and articles in newspapers and so on. That kind of intellectual, uh, generally speaking, as I said, are in, a, are in a sense already part of an establishment, right? And there is a whole professional life where they talk to each other. And there is a specialized language in which, you know, this language in which we are talking now is not a language 
which one would expect to be accessible uh, to any ordinary person on the street. Why should they? You know, that's, this is not ordinary language that we speak. Uh, but <clears throat> there are two things here. One is, of course, could there be from among those who speak the ordinary language in the business, people who are in the business of, you know, ordinary life, right? Where again, I mean, people talk, people speak, people have make opinions, people uh, debate. These are things that are going on all the time, not necessarily only in, in, in the universities. There, there are other spaces where these things happen. So one of the things that could well emerge, and it's, it has emerged in, 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 in history earlier, where certain kinds of certain new kinds of opinion emerge, a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new way of being emerge. Think of something like, once again, think of the phase in Indian history of broadly speaking, I mean, they're, 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 it's probably two, three, 400 years uh, of what are broadly called the Bhakti Sufi kind of movements, mm. right? Mm. Now, in a sense, now looking back in history, you could think of that period, let's say, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 centuries, something somewhere thereabouts, uh, in large, you know, all over India, right? Uh, where clearly there was a new kind of sensibility, a new kind of uh, looking at society. Of course, it was part, there, there were new myths that were created. There were basically new Puranas that were written. There was a whole, you know, you, you, you speak of Satyuga and Ram and so on, but Satyuga and Ram, the way most people understand it, is not Valmiki's Ramayan. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Tulsi's Ramayan, right? It's Tulsi's Ramayan, which is, which is widely the way in which most people understand that age. Now, mm. that, that is a kind of intellectual uh, intervention, which is clearly, as we now know, long lasting. But who was Tulsi? Tulsi, you know, he was, he was a Brahmin, learned, certainly, in his own way. He was, he was an intellectual in his time. Uh, now, that's, that's a kind of intervention which is very different. It was not a, a, an intellectual among pundits. And this is, this is not a debate among pundits, which of course took place. I mean, there are were, were all kinds of, uh, you know, if, you, if you go back once again into the histories of, of various um, <clears throat> you know, philosophical movements, let us say. But those were clearly like the debates that we now have among university professors. You have, you have those instances as well in Indian history, but those are not the ones which you might say change history or change the nature of society. That's the, that's the kind of difference that, one, uh, that I'm suggesting in a way. Now, it's, so it is, it is certainly feasible to think of uh, oh, a, a, a learned person who is well versed in, in the philosophies and and, and uh, uh, histories and so on and so forth, but who is also able to speak and address this other world, which is the world of ordinary men and women, okay? Yeah. Uh, in, in a different language, not the language of, of intellectuals of, or scholars. Uh, that's possible. On the other hand, you can easily think of, uh, of, of intellectual interventions by people who are not scholarly at all, uh, but, but who are able in some ways to give voice. Again, I, I keep repeating, I don't believe honestly that these are necessarily prophet-like figures, right? They're not necessarily single individuals who somehow transform, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they emerge as movements, there would be, groups, there, there would be networks through which these kinds of, you know, largely transformative uh, narratives or, or, uh, or visions, you might even say, of the future emerge. Thank you. Okay, um, 
we're running low on time. We have three people right now who have questions. I'm thinking we should move to the model of giving you the questions and then, and then uh, because of our time limitations. So we have Rishi, um, Sayori, and then David Silverberg. Hi, Professor Chatterjee. It's so nice to meet you. Um, so my question is kind of goes to like your theoretical presentation of liberalism. Um, you, I really appreciated your analysis of the, of the integral state in terms of kind of how you show that it's through the combination of the state apparatus and civic society alongside education that produces hegemony, that produces the liberal state. So I really wanted to kind of discuss if, you know, especially looking at Fichte's presentation um, that you bring up in the early 1800s of this kind of internal field of German society, right, that really laid the, the foundation of nationalism. Um, and I was just wondering if possibly kind of the issue here that you touch on in your book, but at its core in liberalism is it's about legitimating one form of society over all others. Um, so there's kind of little room for plurality without this domination in some respects, without this biopolitical domination or discipline marking, you know, which citizens are worthy of entering into this capitalist domain, which citizens are, should be excluded. Um, so maybe when we're thinking about alternative political formations, could a political formation that focuses on plurality instead of trying to make one meta narrative of a nation, could that possibly give us all, a new way of thinking about representative democracy that moves away from a sometimes static or at least, you know, the multiple claims that people make to a national identity can make it very static, right? Because what we're saying that, you know, marking an enemy and marking an enemy, you're validating your, your unilinear narrative of what is right. Um, so maybe that we could just have just kind of what is the role of plurality um, and in terms of, you know, discussing different debates and really addressing inequalities in power in, in social formations. Okay. And now, um, Sayori. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for the reading and the talk. Uh, so I had two questions. Uh, they are both related to the, uh, to the category of moral persuasion that you're talking about. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, when you talk about moral persuasion as the first, as the, like the early 20th century phase uh, where it's uh, related to nation state and nation states still have this uh, uh, rhetoric of moral persuasion. Uh, and the way I read it, I, I thought you said that it fades away with uh, the coming of the, bi the biopolitical state where populations are uh, differentiated and uh, through cost benefit, different populations are addressed differently, right? Uh, but I was wondering if you could say a little more about uh, this relation because uh, this sequential relation, because I was wondering how could we think of liberal gov governmentality that does not always have this tussle between the citizen and the population. Um, so is there, a, is there like a historical period in the development of the state that where you have the notion of population, but it's, it's not disaggregated? Because for me, it would seem that from the very moment of, the very moment of conception of the population, it has to be disaggregated into different populations, right? So is there a point in time where the moral persuasion can actually work because there is no tussle between the citizen and the various populations? And uh, again, a list, uh, particularly listening to you talk about this uh, just now about justice uh, in, in the contemporary with the rise of populism and how justice is reconfigured, and especially this rhetoric of the enemy and the victory over enemy there is then a comeback of a moral persuasion idea, right? Because it is very morally charged. Uh, the way you're saying that it's a floating signifier and then you bring all of these differentiated demands and interests, but to say that, look, we all have a common enemy. So that seems very morally charged, but at the same time, I understand it's not the same as a moral persuasion of a nation state, but it still seems in some ways uh, connected through this idea of morality. Thank you. Okay, and finally, our last question is um, David Silverberg. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, 
this was interesting hearing it as a lecture a couple of years ago and then looking at the reading again and now hearing you reflect on it. Um, I wanted to ask a question sort of building off of uh, Shumlok's question, um, particularly about this justice and uh, leaderlessness. Because in a certain sense, I was, um, I was actually, to be honest, a little surprised uh, at the inclusion of the Gilets jaunes at the end of the book. Uh, because as you point out, uh, for instance, Syriza or some of these other sort of left-wing populist movements uh, in Europe, um, functionally what they ended up doing, and I mean, you say this, right, is uh, they did what more or less the right could not, which is impose neoliberal austerity, right? Um, so I'm, I guess the thing that I'm thinking about here is uh, exactly the kind of work that the term populism does when we're then talking about these leaderless sort of uprisings in the street. Um, and one of the reasons I'm thinking about this uh, is, I guess, Foucault, particularly in his discussion of the revolution in Iran, has this idea of the sort of irreducibility of the man in the street, right? This idea that there's some kind of actual transformational process that happens to subjectivity when it finds itself in conflict in this way. Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and then also just building off of, again, uh, Shamuk's, I thought, very uh, interesting and layered question. Um, I'm thinking about the difference in Benjamin particularly between the idea of justice and the idea of law, right? And for Benjamin, he says that when, you know, the law is attempting to institute justice, essentially all it can do is retribution, right? And justice is something that's constantly fleeing and sort of uh, out of reach. And I think it's quite interesting to me that particularly with the Gilets Jean example uh, and Black Lives Matter and everything that's happening right now, right? Um, I do not think it's a coincidence that one of the loudest slogans that one could hear at the Gilets Jean demonstrations is uh, tout le monde déteste la policia, right? Everybody, the entire world hates the police. Uh, by the same token, in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I mean, we know what happened in Minneapolis, right? The police station got burned and hey, it turns out the majority of uh, Americans actually support it. So what I find very interesting about this dynamic is that it seems to make a claim for justice, what appears to be towards the state, while simultaneously actually rendering inoperative the main mechanism by which the state is able to exercise its violence, which is to say, these are movements against the police, right? Which is a part of the repressive state apparatus. At the same time, there is a claim about justice being made. So I'm wondering if we're losing maybe a little bit of um, texture uh, of what's happening in a place like Minneapolis or what's happening in you know, the excerpts of Paris or what's happening even in a place like Shaheen Bagh, uh, when we speak in terms like populism. And when we try to sort of fit it into this sort of notion of politics, which implies leaders, hegemony, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, not much time, uh, but three questions. Well, actually, <laughs> more than three questions. Um, now, um, on the question of of pluralism, uh, plurality, and the homogeneous nation. You see, the interesting problem is that the uh, the the question of asserting uh, the the claim of the nation uh, as a populist claim, this kind of thing that you see, for instance, in 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 what broadly speaking we call the right-wing populist, uh, you know, hyper-nationalist movements, they actually have emerged precisely because the old homogeneity of the nation is seen to be under threat, that that's broken. So in many of these cases, let's say in, in Europe, for instance, there is, there is this, you know, let's say the Le Pen uh, National Front, uh, or used to be called National Front, uh, in, in, in France, or, or a law, large number of these uh, right-wing populist movements, which are fundamentally anti-immigrant, 
is because there is a sense that there is a kind of pluralism or a plurality that has emerged, they are very, very uh, scornful of, broadly speaking, what was called multiculturalism. Uh, and the whole argument was, or the attempt is to reclaim an old homogeneity of the nation that has been, that is seen to have been threatened or even lost. So as a result, the, this tension between pluralism and homogeneity that you see today, you know, uh, the, homogen the, the, the emphasis on homogeneity is because there is a perceived threat posed by the pluralist view. Now, the interesting problem is, can there be a sense of a, 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 a certain unification of citizens around a notion that is also pluralist? You see, this is precisely what had been attempted within a broad para parameter of liberal politics in what used to be called multiculturalism. That is seen to be in, in, in very serious crisis in most of uh, Europe. Uh, and it's, it's still not clear what this new definition of a pluralist, uh, it need not be nation, but, but something that uni uh, unifies the citizens of a state around a pluralist cultural notion, what that would be is, is really in, in, in the West, it's very hard to define uh, at this moment. Um, now, on the question of, uh, on Schombach's question about citizens, uh, sorry, uh, Shari's question, on uh, citizens and, and populations. You see, the idea of citizenship, spe specifically in the, in the case of the, of the welfare state, in the, that welfare state phase, which you might say is the most, most developed form of the liberal state that we've seen so far. Citizenship was a universal claim. Everyone is a citizen and everyone who is a citizen has a claim to a whole range of uh, not just political, but social and economic, uh, even let's say cultural uh, guarantees or rights, which the state will, will provide, right? Now, that is one which did not think of citizens as divided into populations. You see, this is this, the, you know, so the welfare state idea was not one which thought of citizens as having specific characteristics and therefore we must provide people with, uh, supply them their needs or demands according to their specific characteristics as population groups. This was not part of the thinking. This emerges as part of a critique of the welfare state. That the welfare state, in fact, you know, all of those things that the welfare state was end, ended up being wasteful, that it ended up actually denying benefits to those who really needed them and actually giving benefits to people who didn't need them because they could easily afford them. So that's the kind of argument. Uh, and of course, the, the the ideological edge of that would be this all-encompassing state, which takes over every part of uh, everybody's lives. So, so that's where you begin to get this other, and it's a, it's a very technical administrative apparatus. You see, that's the more, more important thing. The, the idea of identifying specific target population groups and supplying them with specific needs, their specific needs, requires a whole administrative apparatus, uh, which is hugely technical, right? And that is why the experts and the policy sciences and all of those things. So that's the, um, now it is, it is because that is the state or, or the, the condition of government, which, where the moral claims are evacuated as it were, so the, 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 unlike the old welfare state, this is a state which, does, which even does not claim any moral, particular moral standing. It does not have a moral claim on, on citizens as such, right? 
it's it's like you know a kind of service agency uh, very largely and that is what the state was or or government was reduced to that's the whole idea that government will be minimal uh, it will only supply those things which other agents which the market could not supply for instance that's the kind of thing that the government would do it did not make any big moral claims on the thing now that is where i am suggesting that the new what would, would emerge finally as populism this new popular initiatives this attempt to inject a certain moral uh, purpose to political agitation right that emerges as a reaction so you know one of the things you could make you could argue is that because politics had had basically uh, uh, eliminated its moral claims that there was there was you know what was the point in this politics people were people did become apathetic to in 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 the political sense that this is where the people in a sense reclaim a certain moral agency through these um, these you often leaderless uh, political movements which emerge particularly in the last 15 20 years they've they've emerged and that's where the moral claim so there is see populism is very deeply it makes moral claims uh, as as you just rightly pointed out it is in and very often it is successful precisely in making or in in a sense reclaiming the old moral agency of the nation so to the extent that a lot of the right wing populist movements actually make the you know there's a whole narrative of reclaiming a certain moral claim of the nation as it used to be okay uh, and so you're completely right that it is in that in that state of where the the moral space had been evacuated by governments that is where populism in a sense injects a new sort of moral dimension to political mobilizations all right uh, david's question um uh, now i think see one of the arguments that you seem to be uh, making is that populism ought ought to be restricted only to uh to movements that become parties as it were so you have parties with organizations so such as syriza uh, podemos and so on those those have been called populist parties but they have they they emerge as movements but then acquire the form of regular political parties as we know they've gone into elections they've then uh, even participated in government and so on uh, and so that's that's one form whether or not you want to call these other movements that are taking place that have been taking place which are leaderless which do not have the form of parties whether or not we should call them populist and the reason why i would i would uh, insist that they be called populist whether or not they turn into parties is a, is another matter uh, because of the specific uh, it's 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 the form of the movement how does the movement uh, carry itself out so in a sense this whole argument of um of a, of of a people who are unified through these this this position of equivalence uh vis-a-vis -vis an enemy you see that is a form which continues into whether it's it's the yellow vests or uh or the occupy movements or uh black lives matter today that there is an enemy it's very interesting that you suggest uh, that the police as an enemy uh it's it's a very interesting uh, observation because in a sense that is perhaps what is unifying you know if you think of of black lives matter for instance uh, from you know 6 7 8 years ago to where it is now today uh, it may be that this identification of an enemy in the police and of a series of actions of different kinds you know not necessarily all violent 
both peaceful, violent, and, and, and a whole range of things, but unified precisely in opposition to the police may have may be the, res the reason why we see it having expanded so much uh, in the last few years. The interesting question is, and this is what is posed, I think, or, or uh, you know, the analysis, the analytical apparatus of uh, populism um, as, as, a, as having a particular reason or rationality behind it is whether or not this particular way of posing the relation between people and its enemies, the uh, enemy being the police, whether this is sufficient in continuing, you know, how far is there a limit to which this mobilization can proceed, after which it cannot. Either it has to shift the definition, in other words, fill out the content of the enemy through some other uh, material, so shift or expand the nature of the enemy, uh, or whether it, 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 uh, it exhausts itself. Uh, it's, as far as I'm concerned, I, I cannot make any predictions on this. This will depend very much on, on how the movement proceeds. But it would, seem, it would seem to me that this way of posing the movement, both as leaderless on the one side and as having this particular nature of the enemy on the other, uh, is likely to reach a limit after which it would not be able to renew itself or reproduce itself or expand itself uh, in order to sustain a movement. Uh, but that's my, my sense. But I think, I think the, the, the uh, analytical uh, apparatus of, of uh, populism uh, provides for a certain way of, uh, uh, of observing and uh, assessing the possibilities of these movements um, that I, I am reluctant to give up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been really amazing to have you here. And um, sorry we went a bit over, but um, I think it raises a lot of issues, obviously, that we're thinking about very intensively uh, as we move through this very bizarre year uh, and towards a terrifying election. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, so I guess it's I, how we end in these situations is always a little awkward too, but <laughs> thank you everybody for coming. And um, we hope to see you back in um, New York. Um, in soon. a later month time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although you'd yes. probably look almost the same, maybe slightly different background if you were geographically <laughs> much closer. <laughs> That is actually true, yes. You yeah. probably still see me only on the screen, yes. Right, exactly. Oh. Anyway, um, okay. okay, till next time, which I don't, the exact date I don't have in front of me, but um, I believe that next time um, we'll be hearing from Professor um, Jack Hawley. Okay. Thank Farewell, you. everybody. Thank you, Professor. Any? Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Yeah. <laughs>